Good evening. <coughs> I'm Valerie Neal, Space Shuttle Curator and Chair of the Space History Department here at the museum. Uh, on behalf of General Daly, our director, and indeed our entire staff, I'd like to welcome you on this rainy night coming out to hear this wonderful lecture. Uh, we really appreciate seeing a full house. <coughs> Tonight I would like to also uh, recognize our generous sponsor of this lecture, uh, which is Boeing Company, one of our most loyal uh, sponsors of events and activities here at the museum. Uh, Brigadier General Leo Brooks, a retired U.S. Army and one of Boeing's vice presidents, is here with us tonight. Uh, Boeing has sponsored the aviation hangar at the Udvarhazy Center. Uh, they are providing for the renovation of milestones of flight, which you may have noticed on your way in here tonight. And we have a spectacular exhibit called Above and Beyond, courtesy of Boeing. So, uh, General Brooks, may I ask you to stand for a moment and let's all express our appreciation. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for uh, your involvement in this and that of your company. The museum established the John H. Glenn Lecture in Space History in 2004 as an opportunity for us to invite key figures in spaceflight here to reflect on their careers. Our inaugural speaker was John Glenn himself. And he usually is here, either as uh, a member of the stage group or as a very interested listener in the audience. Uh, he sent his regrets that he could not be here with us tonight. Uh, this is a very special lecture for him, uh, particularly in the choice of speaker this year, who is one of his uh, great friends. For me, it's a pleasure to introduce someone that Senator Glenn and all of us have admired for quite some time, and that is Dr. Catherine D. Sullivan. Kathy and I first met in the early 1980s when we were the only women and the only PhDs in a briefing room at Marshall Space Flight Center and the only women and PhDs who were in the neutral buoyancy simulator there. How things have changed since 30 plus years ago. Since then, Kathy has had four stellar careers to date, and I suspect she is not finished yet. We know her best as an astronaut. Uh, she was one of the first six women who were selected in the class of 1978 to be the first astronauts to fly on this shuttle, the new space shuttle, not yet finished. She was just 32 then, one of the youngest people in the astronaut group, and she was just out of graduate school uh, with a PhD in geology, contemplating whether she would launch her career in space or on the ocean and under the ocean as an oceanographer. She ended up flying three times on the space shuttle, and I think everybody in the audience knows that she became, on her first mission in space, the first U.S. woman to do a spacewalk, to go out on extravehicular activity, uh, a very historic milestone in our space program. That was in 1984. Uh, on a mission that was a science and technology mission. She flew again in 1990 uh, on the mission that probably was the capstone of her astronaut experience, the mission to deploy the Hubble Space Telescope. She was primed to go out and do another spacewalk if necessary, but as it happened, the deployment went smoothly enough that even though she was suited up, she didn't get to go outside uh, to solve an emergency. So that was a kind of good news, bad news experience, I think. And then her last mission was perhaps the one closest to her heart in terms of its thrust. It was NASA's first mission to planet Earth in 1993. Uh, 
I may have done the dates wrong. Did I say Hubble 1990? 1992 was the mission uh, to planet Earth um, mission where she was one of several scientists on board conducting an Earth science mission. Uh, her field of undergraduate studies and her passion as a scientist. Uh, that was the Atlas mission. All in all, she went around the Earth 351 times. She spent more than 532 hours in space, and she accumulated three and a half hours outside the space shuttle on a spacewalk. We have in our collection the glove she wore on that first spacewalking mission in 1984. We also have her Society of Women Geographers pennant that she took into space with her uh, to commemorate her professional affiliation. She's won many awards over her career, both from NASA and from NOAA, uh, from all the organizations she's been um, associated with. She's in the Astronaut Hall of Fame. She is also the first recipient of the National Air and Space Museum Trophy for Current Achievement, first awarded in 1985. That career in itself is remarkable, and few could surpass it. But in addition, and at the same time that she was an astronaut, she was also a practicing oceanographer. Captain Catherine Sullivan of the U.S. Navy Reserve was actively involved in doing research um, in the oceans, and she spent uh, 18 years with the Navy, partly concurrent with her 15 years with NASA. The next part of her career was to be an educator. Uh, she spent another 15 years in Columbus, Ohio, where she was president and CEO of a wonderful science museum there called COSI, the Center for Science and Industry. And then she moved over to Ohio State University, uh, where she was the founding director of a Center for Mathematics and Policy in the John Glenn School of Public Affairs. She responded to the call of a president for the second time to move to Washington and take a position at NOAA. In 1993, she had come here for uh, several years to serve as the chief scientist of the National Oceanic National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, much easier to say NOAA. And then she came again in 2011 uh, to serve first in an acting capacity and then be confirmed as the Undersecretary for, of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere. What a great title is that? And also serve then as the Administrator of NOAA, a position she currently holds. As a leader and a mentor, Kathy ensures that she is no longer the only woman or the only PhD in any room. Senator Glenn expressed his regard for Kathy Sullivan in these words. There may be no better way to appreciate the earth than to leave it, to look back on the beauty and the fragility of our planet from the vantage point of space. Only a tiny fraction of humanity gets that opportunity. So when someone does, and that person also happens to be one of the smartest people around when it comes to earth sciences, it's good to have her on our side, especially in challenging times. Her role in helping humanity look outward has not prevented her from looking homeward. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming our 2015 John Glenn Lecture Speaker, Dr. Catherine D. Sullivan. Good evening. Thank you. It's actually a little hard for me to get started after that movie because to me that soundtrack which is courtesy of Mickey Urban, Mary Beth Solomon out of Toronto. Uh, I can look at all those pictures and feel like I'm looking at pictures. 
when I watch that video with their music over it, I'm back there. So it's a little bit hard to come back to this theater and start again. Uh, let me extend my thanks to General Daly and the museum team for the invitation to be here tonight and to Valerie for that great introduction. And let me share a little inside baseball story with all of you. The idea for that Kilroy was here shot, you know, hello, here we are. It started in this theater uh, in late 83, early 84. Every space shuttle crew that was going to carry the IMAX camera worked very closely with the filmmakers. We were the third of the space shuttle flights that collected films, the dream is alive. So we knew the storyboard almost as well as the filmmakers did. And we would see the rushes, the raw footage of each of the other two crews. And we came up here one time in, it must have been September or so, uh, to look at the film that our preceding crewmates had caught. And they used that four window shot just to show the earth going by. I think it was pretty dramatic, we loved watching that. But Dave and I quickly were elbowing each other going, we could do that shot. <laughs> we could do that shot a little better. Not that astronauts are competitive, you know, but. Um, <laughs> you might have noticed if you watched closely, Dave looked in the window and just kept waving and waving at the camera and I waved a little bit and looked at the earth and waved a little bit and tried to look at the earth again. Um, it's a well-known pattern of mine wherever I am to be both in the moment and always sort of looking at the landscape or the earthscape around me. But the fascination with the earth that that suggests started well before I ever thought I would climb aboard a space shuttle. Uh, and that's what I'd like to talk with you about today. I'm gonna skip over sort of all of the technical kinds of things that could fill in the flight details that Valerie shared with you uh, and talk about the underlying thread that's sort of the unifying thread of my life story that is the reason that to me, all those different stops on the road she talked about uh, make a certain amount of sense. I think to most people, they look like a random walk through something strange, uh, but there's a unifying logic to me. So I will talk a bit now and share some, some images with you from other experiences about where this passion for exploration and this desire to look at the earth and understand the earth from so many different angles, where that came from and how it binds together the different threads of my life. It starts at a far simpler place than a launch pad. It starts with simple maps at home as a very little girl, beginning with the simplest of gas station maps back in the day when there were such things as gas station maps, to the, the nice maps that arrived every month in National Geographic and an endless array of world atlases because I made my parents buy just about every edition of a world atlas that came out. And these were my first vehicles for exploration combination of the information in the maps and the imagining in my mind let me explore peoples and cultures and places long before it was anything like possible for me to actually go see those places. At a fairly early age, thanks to a, a really great teacher, uh, I discovered I have a certain lovely natural flair for foreign languages. And so I made a simple 10-year-old's equation, interest in geography, talent for languages, combine those together, and somehow it will turn into a life in which people buy you airline tickets so you can actually go see those places. So I focused on foreign languages in high school and actually chose my university both because it was affordable, not a small deal, uh, but also because it had really strong language programs and that's where I figured I would end up. Uh, it turns out when I got to college, I was required to take some natural science courses and over all my best tantrums and most strenuous objections, I found myself in an oceanography and a marine biology class. And it was through those courses of study, but more importantly, the explore, exploratory and adventurous lives of the professors, that I realized earth sciences was likely a much better path to this career and future of airline tickets that I was dreaming of. Uh, and so I shifted off into, uh, into the natural sciences. Of course, just a bit before getting to university, I, like all of you and many others, was entranced by the first photos of astronauts from the moon looking back at our Earth, the, the really iconic and famous Earthrise photos taken by Bill Anders on Apollo 8 and every other crew since. The Christmas Eve address from the Apollo 8 crew orbiting the moon. Uh, who was not stunned and awed by this, this adventure, this extraordinarily grand scale of a human adventure? And that also started a, a, a piece of my drive. As I sat there as a young, middle-class suburban gal in Southern California, aiming at 
office-based, classroom-based studies of languages, and sort of dimly realized, oh my goodness, there are people whose life centers around grand challenges and adventures like this. It was stirring and compelling. And in a vague and not very focused way, I wondered if it might somehow come true that my life could have adventures like that in it. So that sort of clarified for me that what I really wanted to try to do was be an explorer, whatever that actually meant. I'm not sure I knew at 17 any better than I knew at 10. Uh, but off I went to college and encountered those professors and found a track that I could see would take me more strongly in that direction and actually would let me still use and even make some maps, which was like a double benefit. I got to do a tremendous array of expeditions in college even and in graduate school. I got to actually be in the middle of planning them, putting together, not just going on, on a ship and doing what someone told me, but actually part of the thinking process, part of the questioning process. What are we trying to figure out? What do we want to understand about the Earth? What could you measure? What could you see? What could you do? How would you take that on a ship and make it work? Put that all together and go do it. It was just an extraordinary opportunity. And as Valerie alluded to, as I was coming towards the end of my PhD career on that oceanographic track, I had one avenue open to me that would put me in small three-person submersibles miles below the, the sea surface to study the geology of the deep sea floor. And I was passionately excited to go that direction. And then NASA sort of sent out signals that said, you know, we have this other research ship. It's going to go vertical instead of horizontal. <laughs> it's going to go ever so slightly faster. Uh, we don't need a lot of people, but we'll take a few. And, you know, if you're one of the lucky few, you know, you'll actually get to look out the window yourself and see the kinds of sights that the astronauts before me had recorded in their spectacular images. Uh, and so I threw my hat in the ring. The odds were vanishingly small for everyone who threw their hat in the ring, but the odds were dead flat zero if you didn't throw your hat in the ring. You know, so you might as well try. Uh, I was accepted, as Valerie said, in the class of 78. And after a number of years of further study, further preparing, it's, it's always sort of back to school before the good bits happen. And then after some other interesting experiences like you know, learning how to fight fires, uh, selecting my very favorite assortment of freeze-dried foods uh, and drinks. Uh, I forget all the Tang commercials, orange mango is the coveted drink <laughs> aboard. The, you, you can have serious food fights over the last container of orange mango. Uh, we finally reached launch day, and launch day in the shuttle era always started with an event like this, the sort of ritual breakfast. Here's another one of the inside baseball stories. By the time the shuttle program came along, the steak and eggs, hefty, hearty breakfast of the Apollo days were gone. 17 cameras were in the room. You were a fool if you took any bite of your food. You sat and smiled and yammered for the cameras. Then they were thrown out and you had a bite to eat and left. Uh, and then finally, walking out to the launch pad with your crewmates. You have, of course, done this walkout before in a very, very detailed rehearsal and for other different tests where you go out to the launch pad and climb aboard the vehicle. Every crew that I was on on launch day as we walked out at that moment remarked to each other, this time we're not driving back. You know, this time we leave vertical, not in a car. <laughs> and, and so there I was, uh, not many years out of graduate school, found myself bolted to a launch pad in Florida. Uh, the scene you saw in the IMAX film, ignition and liftoff, and eight and a half minutes, we were over England. Uh, and in fact, we got chewed out by the Royal Air Force when we arrived over England because one of our radio transmissions used a frequency that they believed they owned for the day and they did not appreciate our barging in. <laughs> we tried to compose a clever retort, but by the time we came up with the clever retort, we were over Africa somewhere and they couldn't have heard us. <laughs> Zero to 17,500 miles an hour in eight and a half minutes. Think about that. I know you've had dinner and cocktails, but think for a moment, that means Every minute for eight and a half minutes, you added about 2,000 miles an hour to your speed. Zero to supersonic fighter over and over again for eight and a half minutes. Uh, it's just extraordinary. And when the engines finally cut off, everything is in free fall, and I lifted my gaze from the instrument panels I had been staring at up to the windows and had a view like this, the absolutely stunning view uh, looking out the window at, uh, at the earth beneath you. It absolutely pulled the breath out of me. So much so that as soon as I saw it, I blurted out, 
wow, look at that. And we were right in the middle of a critical checklist. So of course my boss said, no, 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 not yet. I thought, swell, eight minutes and 32 seconds into flight and you're being chewed out, you screwed something up. This is just, this is not going well. But it really will leave you absolutely quite speechless. You go around the entire planet every hour and a half. You fly through every time zone on the planet in 90 minutes. So I leave it as an exercise to you to imagine what you have your watch set to. I'll tell you now, UTC or Greenwich Mean Time is not the answer, so good luck with that one. You get a sunrise and a sunset, a sunrise and a sunset every 45 minutes, whether you need it or not. So you think you're gonna sleep for eight hours, the lights are going to go on and then go off and go on, like big time, every 45 minutes. And as all of those extraordinary particular sights go past the windows, and you will hear this, I think, in various words, but common thought from just about every astronaut, every person that's had this experience, you realize very clearly that our planet is not really made up of continents and countries. It's, it's made up of elegantly interconnected and very dynamic systems. You see the full sweep of a mountain range, not the bit that's in Canada or the bit that's in Mexico or the bit that in, that's in Pakistan. You see full weather systems, not the underlying geographic boundaries. And ocean currents, there are no lines for exclusive economic zones. There are very few political borders that you can detect at all. And usually that's because of land use pattern differences on one side or the other. So the predominant impression that I think all of us come back with is a, a deeper realization that it is, it is really the case that we live together and interconnected with each other on one single planet that, has a, that is a web, web of interconnected dynamic systems. Just like in the opening scene where I had trouble looking in the cabin towards the camera as I was supposed to do because I kept looking at the earth, I always had trouble pulling myself away from the window to go back to work and do my, my everyday chores in the flight plan, except for one time. The time you get to put on a spacesuit and slip outside and actually have that extraordinary view with no, no window frame constraining your view, really just looking out full field of view uh, absolutely was spectacular. The planet scrolls by beneath you. It seems to be moving at this elegant and stately pace. It's hard to remember it's 17,000 miles an hour because it's just sliding by sort of ever so gracefully. Uh, that great EVA shot that you saw in the IMAX clip where I was coming back across the payload bay, I remember very vividly watching my hands where I was moving them to make sure I didn't break something. Uh, I was working my way across a set of instrumentation that's not normally planned to be an EVA pathway, but we had a repair job that cropped up unexpectedly. When I watched my hands, I felt like I was doing a handstand on that sort of instrument shelf. And when it came time to pause for a moment for another IMAX scene, I locked my hands and took my attention away from those and began to just sort of look around me. And when I looked down, sliding beneath my boots was the northern coast of Venezuela, just scrolling by. And for a moment I thought, gee, this is like hanging from a tree limb off a jungle gym. So, and I would look here and it's a handstand and I would look here and it's hanging off a tree limb. I thought, this is very fun. You know, up and down can be whatever you want. I had no sense of falling. Some spacewalkers report a sense of, some sense of uh, prospect of tumbling when their eye suddenly moves to a very far horizon. Uh, that was, uh, that just happened to not be my experience. So terribly short EVA by any modern day standards, but a spectacular experience. Uh, and you know, to look between the boots of your spacesuit and see the National Geographic map shapes going between your boots for the little kid that loves maps, I mean, that's a pretty good office view. One of the most commonly spoken phrases on a space shuttle flight, or at least on all of mine, by the way, no matter how many fancy PhDs and super qualified test pilots you had aboard, one of the most commonly uttered phrases as folks looked out the window was, look at that, it's just like the maps. You know, so <laughs> kind of stunning. Spectacular views, this is, I think, a shot from a GoPro camera that one of the station EVA crew members mounted outside just to give you a sense of all the things going on uh, outside a spaceship. So the view is just, the view is one of the two greatest treats of spaceflight. The other treat is just living and working in zero gravity. 
you still have to do a number of the mundane chores. I always tell school audiences, your mom is not there. You're gonna do the cleaning and the cooking and everything else. Uh, on my third flight, we took turns canvassing around who wanted which bits from their meals and putting them, injecting the water to rehydrate them and put them in the heating oven. Um, fun letting things float around. If you're making a tortilla sandwich, you open the tortilla package and you leave your tortilla there. Close the package, then you pick up the peanut butter and you open the lid, you leave the lid there because you can. And you take out a dollop of peanut butter, put the jar of peanut butter there, smile as it stays there. You know, my mother would not have been mad at me for playing with my food in zero gravity. It was not, it was not allowed at home, but I'm sure she would smile on the, the antics in space. It was an ethic on all of my crews that we had been given a perfectly conditioned, absolutely repaired and spotlessly clean spaceship when we launched. And it was just tacky to bring a dirty spaceship home. You've been playing air hockey with balls of orange juice and other such things along the way. The bulkheads and, and decks are sort of splattered and stained a little bit. And so it was a normal routine on each of my flights to moisten hand towels the night before we re-entered and go around the ship and clean it up so that we, re we returned to the ground crew, a spaceship in as fine a form as the one we had been given. More zero G, fun with food. Uh, this is me uh, loosing, letting loose a bag of M&Ms. This is a really great little physics experiment. You cut the top off the bag and you pull the bag slowly away. The M&Ms don't know about that. <laughs> you pulled on the bag. They're gonna try to stay right where they were. Uh, you now have a cloud of M&Ms. You can tap on one and send it across the spacecraft to your crew. You can, as you see here, snarf it out of the air like the goldfish in your tank. Um, speaking of goldfish, if, is there anyone here that doesn't know Pepperidge Farm goldfish crackers? Pepperidge Farm goldfish will display schooling behavior in this environment. <laughs> so, it's a really extraordinary thing. Your vocabulary actually changes in orbit. I mean, if you have table manners and you say, would you pass me this and would you pass me that, you will pretty quickly find your vocabulary changes to w send me, you know, will you send me my orange juice or will you send me the camera or will you send me the spacesuit which is 300 pounds? And in any of those cases, it's just the right amount of push with your hand and it floats elegantly across the cabin. Very important to remember the moment you land, that doesn't work anymore. <laughs> and the final great sport, I mentioned 3D, 3D air hockey with balls of orange juice. Those wanna be sort of golf ball size balls of orange juice, but you can do many other things with globs of water. Fabulous physics demonstrations of hydrostatic force. You see it all forms itself into a perfect sphere. You see every little drop that spins off is it, its own little sphere. And then you can do really cool things like, I don't know, embed a GoPro camera in it. Or it's really cool to put an Alka-Seltzer tablet in the middle of it and let all the other bubbles form. <laughs> it's just, like I said, your mother would not be upset with you for this. Do not try, do not try it at home, but your mother will not be upset. So some of the fun and some of the just, you know, unique experiences that, uh, <laughs> there, you see it? Yep, take a look at that. You gotta do them because you gotta do them because you can, right? It's just extraordinary. Uh, so I, as Valerie uh, alluded to, I was very fortunate to get to serve and fly on three shuttle flights. And in, in this era of the shuttle program in particular, because, you know, we're officially the old fogies here in my class, um, every flight started literally as blank pages in a book. This is not like high school where you're handed a textbook and you need to learn diligently with great discipline how to just sort of learn it all and repeat or regurgitate answers. And it's, it's not even like a, a written procedure that we have, for example, in the federal government where it's a very elaborated procedure and it's mu very much about due process, checking off all the boxes. We were given assignments with statements like, you're gonna go deploy the Hubble telescope. Full end of instruction. There hasn't been a Hubble telescope before. No one has done this before. You get a group of people together say, how do you think we do this? Oh, I'll bet we bolt it into the space shuttle. Good point. Uh, I'll bet it needs electrical power. Ah, when you're gonna deploy it, what do you think you do first? And we would go through it. So we wrote the checklist that we executed. And if you watch a space flight and if it gives you an impression of overly mechanical or overly disciplined people. What I want you to think about is they are the orchestra members that wrote the score. They are performing their symphony. Uh, it is, it's elegant and creative every bit as much as it now is skilled uh, and disciplined. It's just quite an extraordinary thing to get to be a part of. 
So if I'm my third flight, one other thread and one other uh, profound thought was creeping its way into my mind. And, and that was, it was this sense, this recognition of how extraordinary it was personally to see the Earth in this way and how extraordinary it was for us as a generation of human beings to be seeing the Earth from this kind of vantage point. We are all the first generation of human beings that are able to view the Earth this way. Think about that for a moment. Mankind has conceived of Earth as a globe rather than a flat object since Renaissance times, since the early times of the Medici. But to be able to actually see the Earth physically and with your own eyes and with other electronic eyes, to see it in this comprehensive, integrated way, humankind only gained the capacity to do that with the space age. And we are living with the early stages of the fruits of that capability. And I would be remiss, and you probably wouldn't speak to me ever again, if I didn't share some of those views with you, so we'll run some clips here. Um, this is coming up the east coast of the United States. I can pick out my hometown. I can show you where we are right now. Every major city, the arteries, uh, going by as you zoom along it. Uh, sorry, that's Chicago in the upper left just there. My hometown is going by right here, right there, coming down through the middle. Um, fabulous sights, wonderful geography tests. Uh, you'll see Europe in a little bit. Watch for the, the arc of the atmosphere in the upper right. You'll see lightning in the clouds as you go by. Notice that faint green band just above the horizon. Uh, that's a physical phenomenon called the air glow layer. It's the kind of uh, unsexy everyday version of the aurora. It's where solar influences illuminate and trigger luminous responses in the upper atmosphere. And then of course, many times you see the actual aurora, that green glow on the horizon. There absolutely dazzling views, totally entrance everyone who has a chance to see them. These are all run a little faster than that stately pace uh, that I was referring to, by the way. So let's just absorb these for a moment because they're pretty spectacular. There's the aurora in the far distance. You can see the, the bright patches playing along the edge of the aurora, almost like someone's fingers are running it up and down a piano keyboard. More lightning in the foreground here major cities, major arteries, the geometry of the different cities and, and light patterns are coming over the Alps and heading down towards Italy. Those actually show you the culture of the underlying land. It's distinctly clear when you're over North America with the rectilinear settlement patterns of Canada and the United States. It's distinctly clear when you're over Asia just by a glance at the light patterns that you're at the small village sparse settlement pattern of, of Asia or China. This is you just come across the Straits of Gibraltar, you move past the Balearics, You've got uh, Africa on your right, southern Europe, and coming up to uh, Italy and Greece or Crete. There's the tip of Italy, there's Corsica, Sicily. The main fault uh, up the boot of Italy, just here with the teal on your right. Absolutely fabulous scenes. So it's wonderful and it's extraordinary to look out windows with your own eyes. But by my third flight, I realized you know, it's not gonna be enough for me that I got to see it this way. And it's not gonna be enough for me that I can, that I can take home and will bring home with me an extraordinary collection of uh, spring break pictures or vacation pictures and I can wow people forever with them. And as a scientist, I realized it's not gonna be enough for me that I come home and go back to fundamental research and the fruits of my work are journal papers and scholarly articles that go into bound volumes and sit on shelves and maybe someday percolate a bit into generating some value to humankind. Uh, I came back wanting to do something different. And the key to that was to understand the different ways we could look at Earth that were beyond my own eyes. So let's do another little bit of a world tour looking at these scenes with different eyes. Satellite-based sensors now can let us look at the Earth and see marine chlorophyll concentrations, the vitality, the biologic vitality of the land and the sea. As you watch this loop go, you'll see the blue bands come down to the bottom and then they move up, it goes black in the, in the northern ocean areas. Now that blue, blue and green band is moving back north. You're seeing the seasons. You're seeing southern hemisphere winter here where it's dark and there's no daylight. Now you're seeing it become winter in the northern hemisphere. The green patterns off the coastlines are the, the biologically productive areas where fisheries thrive, where plankton blooms occur. 
and you actually see that the patterns in the ocean, the circulation patterns, and you see the natural rhythms, the natural seasonal rhythms of the Earth. With other eyes, we can see sea surface temperature. Here's a fabulous visualization from the NOAA vis Visualization Lab. Th this, these are not cartoons. This is not artist rendering. These are data. These are actual measurements and observations of the Earth's oceans at very fine scale. Look off the tip of South Africa. You see all those little lifesavers, those little donut rings. Those are major eddies in the Agulhas Current. You can watch them spin off into the southern Atlantic and migrate across the central, south central Atlantic towards South America. You can look up in the Gulf of Mexico and see a big hairpin in that reddish orange strand. That's the famous loop current of the Gulf of Mexico. And you can look off the east coast of the United States and see those bright green and orange colors. And if you look carefully, you'll see it's, green, it's cooler temperature colors on one side towards shore and a little warmer off the other side. That's the Gulf Stream. And look, you see right now up off Long Island, Nova Scotia, a very big, bright green ring. That's another one of those deep ocean eddies. So this, this is real data. This is actually the pattern of surface currents in the world's ocean uh, as measured, not as imagined and not as modeled. The surface of the ocean, is you kind of understand that, right? A satellite can look down and see the surface of the ocean. Got that, pretty simple. As a marine geologist who studied the seafloor, here's the outrageous thing about satellite oceanography. We actually can make measurements of the surface of the seafloor that when you meld them, when you combine them with really elegant math and physics, let you drain the ocean. So you're seeing here the topography of the seafloor. You're seeing there's Hispaniola. You're seeing the Mid-Atlantic Ridge coming up here, the deep mountains in the middle of the seafloor. This is as measured and derived from satellites, not from surface ships like I sailed on. My oceanographic research vessels, if you were lucky, you were doing eight knots when you were making bathymetric maps, 17,500 miles an hour to cover the ocean surface. Finer scaled bathymetric detail than we have over most of the ocean from any oceanographic research vessel and you know, quantifiable to be able to combine with other sorts of data. Just extraordinary capability. We use this not just to make pretty visuals, but certainly at NOAA, most importantly, we use these kinds of data to do really very, very useful things. Here's one, uh, again, using that same method that we use to calculate the seafloor, but with a different calculation, we track tsunamis. So you see in the upper right, that bright ring emanating from Japan is the, the ground wave emanating from the March 2011 earthquake. You see all the bright colors in the Japanese mainland. Those are the different shocks and aftershocks. You see dots lighting up as that white band moves away. Those are seismographs lighting up because they've registered the ground wave as it goes by. And now if you look back up at Japan again, you'll start to see what look like sort of interference patterns or fine crescent patterns just to the right of that pink spot off Japan. That's the tsunami letting loose. That's the final break of the seafloor that triggered the tsunami. And again, these are actual measurements. This is not a model or a cartoon of what the tsunami might have been like. Now the dots that are lighting up are sensors on the bottom of the ocean, 10, 15,000 feet underwater, NOAA's DART sensors, NOAA's Tsunami Warning Network that measures, that detects tiny little waves, half an inch height, on the sea surface 15,000 feet above that are the early expression of the tsunami and sends warnings out to international tsunami warning centers. NOAA runs the United States Tsunami Warning Centers in Palmer, Alaska and Honolulu, Hawaii and we are the hub for the International Tsunami Warning Center. So as you watch this go on, you'll see the wave now. It's reached South America. It's shooting through the gap at the Scotia Arc. It's coming around the other way between New Zealand and Antarctica. And you, you begin to see these faint patterns. This is, this is like a bell that was rung and is still reverberating. Long, long after you heard the sound of it, there's still this underlying rung, 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 rung. The Earth is ringing and the ocean is propagating that ringing wave all through all the different ocean basins. So amazing things that we can do. Your weather forecast, your everyday weather forecast, comes from and depends critically on this capability to look at the Earth. And our final little tourist video here shows you each of these little sets of dots as they move around is the footprint of one environmental monitoring satellite. You don't need to worry about the colors. There's a code on the left 
some are surface observations, some are microwave observations. But the point I'd like you to take away from this is, look at that roving pattern of satellite footprints. Those are collecting tens of billions of data points every single day about our ocean and about our atmosphere. And all of those data go to many, many researchers, but critically, they go into the supercomputers at NOAA's National Weather Service, and they are the basis, they are the, the understanding and the current pulse of the planet that you have to have to create a weather forecast. This is NOAA's bread and butter. In just ingesting these data every day, ingesting surface observations, and ev every six hours updating the pulse of the planet so that we can extend the projection forward and tell you what's coming next. So knowing when I flew my flights, knowing that these kind of eyes existed, that this capability to look at Earth as more than vacation pictures and more than tourist postcards, knowing that that existed really motivated me to come back to Earth and not just go on the cocktail circuit and not just talk forever about what I had done, but find a way to actually make this capacity matter in the everyday world. To have this capacity change not only how we can see the world, but actually change how we live our lives and how we make decisions from head of household all the way up to head of state. Decisions about public safety, about natural resource use, and about economic opportunities. I wanted to come back and find a way to help bring this insight to life in our countries and our communities as governments, as businesses, and as decision makers. And that in a not very short nutshell is how and why I found myself at NOAA and keep coming back. Because this is what NOAA does. We take this capacity, we take all this information, and we turn it into what we call environmental intelligence. The basic measurements from our eyes in the sky and our sensors on the land, the robust observations, compu modern computing, advanced models of the Earth, and make it matter. Let me unpack just one example of this for you quickly. A great example of environmental intelligence in action is, is any hurricane, but let's look at it through the example of Sandy. This was a $50 billion storm. 24 states were impacted. At its greatest size, the tropical storm force winds were 1,000 kilometers, 600 miles in diameter. That's just extraordinary. And NOAA had a front seat and critical role, not just in sending out the forecast before the storm to prepare people, but also in our response planning. Our weather models, powered through that combination I've talked about of satellite observations, upper air soundings, advanced computing. This is what was critical to giving advanced warning and preparation information to key national decision makers. This is a picture from one of the Sandy briefings in the Situation Room at the White House. You see the President Obama, of course, on the left, uh, Director of Homeland Safety, John Brennan, on the right, and in the screen on the far right, the back of the room, you see in the middle, Craig Fugate, the Director of FEMA, and the inside on the upper right is our briefer, NOAA's briefer from the National Hurricane Center. So helping the country prepare, informing the emergency responders, NOAA flies hurricane hunter aircraft. We're, we're the guys that do the, the, uh, the key measurements in the storm. 10 missions over four days inside the storm, getting the measurements that help us really define how it's behaving and what it's going to do. In addition to the Jim Cantori wind forecast, the ones that the TV guys use to stand out on the beach and get blown away. <laughs> that, that's, drama, that's dramatic TV and it's sort of frightening noise, but people don't die from wind in hurricanes. They die from water in hurricanes. So storm surge forecast, again, powered by a similar array of measurements and instruments, tide gauges, computational methods. Those storm surge warnings that come out from NOAA also go to local and county emergency managers so they can know where do you need to issue the evacuation orders and where can you stage your response materials for the, the moments right after the storm. Wind gust forecasts help Jim Cantore do his broadcasts, but more importantly, they help utility companies know where the electrical system is most prone to wires coming down and long-term outages, and they too preposition their response assets. As this loop will show, our forecast for Hurricane Sandy five days out was spot on. Yes, the European Center's model was the one that deviated from the, uh, the basket of 20 models a day or two earlier, but by day five, every model was showing the left hook. That matters to America, 
in particular because at day four, Craig Fugate starts to make his critical decisions. So at day five, we put this track out. That's the actual warning cone that we put out. If we run the loop again, and again, this is a real data loop, not a cartoon. You'll see Sandy sort of brewing up in this sort of confused way at the bottom. Pause about here. You'll see the five day warning cone with the uncertainties. And then the actual loop of what the storm did, you'll see it was you know, right down the alley, spot on forecast, five days of warning, more than the best that you can expect science to do. But still, as we all know, the devastation and the human toll from Sandy were just immense. We all remember what, seeing this site in the Jersey Shore on our televisions of the, the drowned and damaged roller coaster. Um, many, many neighborhoods flattened by waves and surge. Houses toppled off their footings uh, into the sand and sea. And then the ravages of fires, in particular in Breezy Point, that came through afterwards. Noah's role in Sandy did not stop there. We were also central to the response after the storm. We're the guys that fly the aerial surveys that make the damage maps for FEMA that feeds right into their damage classification system. And also as the federal, on -scene, uh, federal lead for oil spill responses, we get the images like these that help us know where you've had fuel leaks, ship damage, tanks damage, they're polluting bays and harbors, and it will represent a fire hazard and a toxic hazard as people try to start up the economy of their community again. The Port of New York and New Jersey is one of the nation's biggest at you know, tens of millions of dollars per hour of commerce transiting through there. The port's declared closed when a hurricane goes through, of course. And then there's all sorts of damage and debris everywhere. How do you reopen the port? The answer is you send NOAA out, our hydrographic survey ships. Went out even before the storm had passed, frankly, and began to do the survey work that would let, let the Coast Guard reopen the port. Fisheries are also damaged, and everywhere along our coastlines, fisheries are an important source of protein and food, but also a tremendously important component of our coastal economy. We mobilized our national marine fisheries teams to do rapid assessments of the habitats and shorelines and fishery sources, again, so governors and fishing commissions could safely reopen the fishing grounds. And finally, it's NOAA's satellites that relay the search and rescue beacons from all around the globe and help emergency responders get out and rescue people in need. And after Sandy, one of those key events happened off the coast of Wilmington, North Carolina. A vessel carrying 14 people was sinking 207 miles offshore. It's the beacon relay through NOAA satellites and some of our search and rescue queuing that goes to Coast Guard and enabled them to get their heroes out and get all, all 14 people off that vessel safely. Sandy was, I think, a, a turning point in the nation's conversation about emergency preparedness and, and even about resilience, not only knowing a blow is coming, but having planned and designed and prepared to be better able to absorb that blow with less long-term consequence. It reminded us everywhere along the East Coast, and it had been a very long time since the East Coast had this reminder, when Mother Nature decides she's moving the ocean into your neighborhood, she's gonna win. It's gonna happen. And it's important when those events are bearing down on you that you've got a source of reliable and actionable and timely environmental intelligence to improve your capability to get out of harm's way and respond to what's coming at you. Well, when I was that young girl looking at gas station maps, uh, dreaming of airline tickets, I can assure you I, I never ever imagined, I wouldn't have dared imagine that these would be the kinds of adventures and really important things in human life I would someday get to be a part of. It's a little bit crazy to me still how a naive fascination with maps led me to some dim desire to explore and through the happy circumstance of recognizing a talent for languages and frankly now, thanks to the pesky academic requirement that I take some science classes and found my way into the earth sciences with fabulous professors who showed me this life of exploration and curiosity and the, the fun of exploring and unlocking the secrets of the earth. And then other people who helped me see how important and how gratifying it is 
to take that ability to unlock the secrets of our Earth and bring it home and make it matter and make it useful and make it important to all of us here on Earth to give us some basic information and tools that improve our prospects of living wisely as well as living well on this little planet. This entire journey flowed from two simple, very naive impulses that I could not have expressed well at the time at all. A fascination with maps and a desire for the adventure of exploration. And so I stand here tonight, I'd like to think, still that ever curious girl, certainly rather older in the bones, hopefully still as young as heart, and still always looking at the earth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy. That was eloquent visually and verbally and obviously from the heart. Thank you for sharing your perspectives with us. Uh, we're going to have a conversation here for a few minutes, uh, just chatting back and forth, uh, Kathy and me, and then we're going to turn to the audience for some questions. So start thinking about what you would like to ask, and that includes our audience in the planetarium. Um, I will be asking for those questions in five minutes or so. Uh, but right now I'd like to take the prerogative of being part of the program to ask you a question or two. Uh, if you might like to uh, share your further perspectives with the audience. Uh, we'll start with a lightweight question. Oh good. Uh, which is, why do some of your friends call you the most vertical <laughs> girl in the world? <laughs> um, it's a very fun title. and. Uh, Oh, I think I just lost the microphone. Wait, I don't think it matters. Um, no, it's good. Um, I have had the opportunity as an oceanographer to go 8,500 feet below the surface of the ocean in the Alva Submersible to look at the deep ocean geology. And then uh, up in space and on the Hubble flight, the Hubble orbit was the highest. There might have been a, a military flight that went higher, but that information will be classified until we get to claim it. Uh, <laughs> And so if you go 8,500 feet down and 200, 240 nautical, 340 nautical miles up, um, I, I'm told if we registered that with Guinness, it would be a vertical range record for women. Uh, I think I would have to somehow do away with Buzz Aldrin to get the absolute record, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty cool record to hold, I'm, it's informal as it is. It's pretty good. And um, did you find the same sort of wonder in looking at the ocean bottom? Um, I, yeah, I absolutely did, and, and not just the ocean bottom. I mean, the ocean, you know, the ocean is alive. People always ask about the differences between exploring the exploration I've done in the ocean and in space. Obviously, you can't beat the, the distance of the view that you get from orbit with the atmosphere basically not in your way. Uh, it's almost a thousand miles to that horizon, and in the deep sea, it's as far as your sphere of light can take you. So it's a different scale of view, but it's. You know, it's just a, it's a stunning but a sterile view out of spacecraft window and it's a completely living view out a, a submersible window all the way down, even below the photic zone where light doesn't penetrate. There are all sorts of magical midwater creatures. So uh, I was always the guy that wanted to leave one little light on as we went down, but that's taking battery time that will let you drive around on the bottom. So you're mm -hmm. spending these electrons very carefully. Uh, but the midwater, Organisms are ab they're elegant and exquisitely designed and really fabulous. And somewhat alien. <laughs> yes, they're, right. you know, uh, we d look, we discovered alien life forms on this planet in the late 70s at deep sea vents that completely turned over the, the then conventional understanding of what is the, what are the basic ingredients of life, of life, because one of them was, well, life happens where light is. And then you go, you know, 9,000 feet down in jet black waters that are 750 degrees, that are boiling 750 degrees Celsius, and have the pH of a, sulfur, of a sulfuric acid. And it's teeming with life. None of those three things make any sense to what we understood at the time. So we, we found a significant community of alien life here on this planet when I was in grad school. I, want, I, I wonder what life would be like if we were as completely mesmerized by you know, 
that sort of life in the deep sea and, and s valued the water resources of this planet the way we responded to the announcement that it's possible there might be periodic water on Mars. You know, <laughs> how about here? <laughs> very good point, very good point. Um, I'm curious about another uh, thing that grows out of your career. You are trained as a scientist. Uh, you've spent most of your career as a scientist, but you've increasingly moved into the public policy arena, and that's something you probably weren't trained for. Um, so how does one move from the habits and the practices of a scientist to living in public policy and, and shaping the way society thinks about science? Um, carefully and with a lot of learning experiences along the way, is probably the, the short answer. Um, I, you know, I have to give a lot of that back to my parents. I mean, my father was an aerospace engineer. I think my mother, my mother was the policy wonk monke whose life path just never gave her an opportunity really to be in the public sphere. Uh, but she was the one that just absorbed all the newspapers and current affairs you know, voraciously. So I think through that combination, uh, and maybe, uh, maybe my bent towards languages and literature early on, um, I seem to always have both this deep curiosity and about how things work and interest to be able to master that. As, as well as a lot of curiosity and interest in how do, how do people work, how do people make decisions. So mm -hmm. I, I think it was around middle school I realized through reading something, like maybe something about a presidential election, I was really curious about how does a country make a decision? I don't know how I make a decision. You know, you're, as a kid, you're part of your family making a decision. How does a country make a decision? And as my career shows, little dim inklings like that tend to have, tend to grow into big things with me. Um, all right, let's ask if there are some questions from members of our audience. Um, I would like to ask you to speak up so we can hear you. And uh, the lights are coming up so we can see you. And the first hand I spy is right here toward the middle of the uh, auditorium. So Could I repeat the question? Yeah, so I, well, or I'll repeat them. Um, uh, so the first one was, does NOAA get involved in, uh, in matters having to do with the effects of space weather on the Earth? We, we absolutely do. Uh, we run the National Space Weather Prediction Center. It's a branch of the National Weather Service. So any space, any solar storm forecast or warning, public forecast or warning comes from NOAA. Uh, close collaborations, obviously, with NASA. We all share observing assets. but the. The responsibility to actually take that information, meld it with ionospheric and uh, Earth geomagnetic field models, and produce a forecast of effects, and communicate those publicly. That's where the NOAA responsibility lies. Um, and then the second one, um, you know, Navy and Marine Corps, when they put their minds to it, can be pretty close and affectionate cousins. The the harder part is if you have the Air Force or Army guys around. That just <laughs> Sorry, General, both of you generals. <laughs> oh, we we never miss the moment to do little bits of go Army, beat Navy, or go Navy, beat Army, and, and. At a minimum, you have the pennants flying. At, at an absolute minimum. If a Navy guy found something that an Army guy had screwed up, it was really unkind. I saw a gentleman in a red plaid okay. shirt here. Are there observations or um, information from space about the effects of pollution on the planet? Uh, yes, space sensors, and let me add here, almost every answer I give about space sensors, your ability to turn what the space sensor detects into the information you're asking about depends critically on combining it with in situ measurements. The, there, there's virtually nothing that you think about when you think of, oh, a satellite can do that, that the satellite does alone, uh, and you actually have to couple it together in a computer also with a detailed mathematical description of how the underlying process works. So 
Satellites are fabulous. There's nothing magic about satellites, and there's nothing push button about a satellite gives you an answer. This, that, that'll be a, a, what I just said will be true about virtually every can, can satellite show us question that we talk about tonight. But back to your question, yes, satellites are very, very powerful and helpful, uh, with, both with sensors that let us visually see or physically detect where, where different plumes and tendrils of something are going from volcanic ash to ozone to, it's true in the oceans as well to a degree, you can see tracers in the oceans. To understand, well, what is, I see a bright streak in the atmosphere, what is that bright streak, how dense is it, what is its likely consequence to the planet, that takes the other measurements I've been talking about. Many pollutants have an effect, physical effect, on the surface of the earth or on vegetation, and you can see symptoms of that as well. So uh, there are sensors that we have learned, we, we have learned how to extract from what the satellite shows us um, reliable indications of the stress that a plant system is undergoing. So we can tell when it's stressed by water or stressed by certain pollutants. But it's, it's never just the satellite. Is there a question at high in the auditorium? Yes. Yes, sir. Thanks. So the question was, what was the competition like in our class and in particular among the first six women? Um, you know, it was an interesting blend of cooperation and mutual support, good camaraderie and competition. Uh, the, the process by which a flight crew is chosen is deliberately kept pretty much a black box uh, by astronaut office leadership. You know, the, the leadership knows a few things. Everybody wants to fly, everyone wants to fly soon, everyone would rather fly first, and everyone would rather fly every flight. Okay, got that. <laughs> uh, so that's not gonna work. And so the smart thing to do is say, just, just wait till I call you, you know, sit down, be quiet, wait till I call you. So uh, to me, what it turned into was, uh, there were not really, I mean, there were not events or explicit competitions that pit you against another classmate, like in some kind of fly off or, or match racing, and the winner would go on to the next step and the, the loser of that skirmish wouldn't. Uh, but it was more just a continuous and systemic, um, your best, your best bet was always to go peak performance. And your best bet was basically to presume essentially everything is on the record on camera. You're, you know, you're demonstrating what you can do and your character and everything else all the time. Uh, and at the end of the day, whatever the mix was of personal attributes or, or competitive style or leadership style or particular scientific discipline that matched up well with a certain cargo, that was a formula that the, the chief and the deputy of the office would would sort through. And they, of course, would always be looking at an array of flights. They have a flight manifest out far down the road. So they, they were not doing one by the each. They were looking 12 to 24 months down the road and, and trying to do their best at, at pretty complex talent management. So rather like a perpetual audition. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, can we ask if there is a question in the planetarium? And then we'll take that young okay. woman on the left. Yes. Hi. Um, I have a very short two-part question. Uh, the first question being, having been to space, are you a fan of Doctor Who? And the second question being, I have a degree in environmental sciences, and I'm just wondering what your opinions are and how we can get more girls and women involved in environmental science in the STEM field in general. Thank you. So the question of being a fan of Doctor Who, uh, if, if I w were either a serious fan of television or had any much time for television, I might be able to answer that question, but I, I flunked the Doctor Who test, I'm afraid. Um, how, do you get, you know, how do you get young people in this era at all, and then women and underrepresented minorities in particular, more interested in and confident about their abilities in the sciences, there, there just is not a simple answer for. Um, I think, I think this best systemic answer is an awful lot boils down to examples to have in your life. And I, and I, and I do not mean if you can't see it, you can't be it. I, do, I don't mean a young, a young African-American girl has to be able to see an African-American woman doing something or she won't believe she can do it. Uh, if that was the way human beings work, there would never have been a first in anything at all. It certainly helps, but I think 
we should, we should watch out for the reductionist theory of if I can't see one like me, then I can't be one. That's a trap, and it's a really bad trap. Uh, but the examples of, for young girls in particular, you know, the example of their father, uh, what are the signals they get from their father? Are they, do they feel valued and paid attention to when they're cute and pretty and sweet, or also when they're smart and strong and daring? Uh, are they given words? Young people will notice the difference. He's ambitious and great with drive and really gung-ho, and she's sort of pushy and tacky and bitchy. Yeah, you notice that. You don't want to be that other category. Um, early teachers, and my early teachers and te two teacher professors in college were you know, wonderfully even-handed across talent types and backgrounds. And if, if you were passionate, they were passionate in helping you explore your passion. Um, I, I mentioned starting college in language and linguistics and that pesky science requirement. Two of the, those two ocean classes triggered every circuit of excitement in me. I couldn't quite put a finger on what or why, and I had no idea what geologists did or oceanographers did. And so as a 19-year-old you know, French major, I walked up to a tenured professor and said, that class is interesting and your class is really interesting. And that's, this has really got me jazzed. What do you guys do? Really smart question, right? So happily, I picked the right guy. Yeah, he, was, he might have been eight years older than me. Uh, because I think 99% of professors on this planet would have laughed me out of his office back to the French department. Uh, he responded to the underlying interest. He did not fret about how badly put the question was. He responded to the underlying interest that a student was showing and leaned in to find ways to encourage and elicit it and help me explore it. So think about that when you're around young folks or young talent. Are you critiquing them relative to where you currently stand or are you hearing what's actually happening with them and trying to help bring that forward and develop it? Yeah, right. Woohoo! So the question's really about what sorts of physiological changes uh, have occurred to me from going both so deep and so high. Um, the only lasting one is I'm 30 seconds younger than I would have been if I'd stayed home. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, all the rest of the things, the human, you know, human beings are pretty adaptable organisms. So you, you, know, you adapt into zero gravity pretty readily, 99.9% you know, .9 of people. Interestingly, I had seven days in orbit on my first flight and then a five, six year hiatus, five and a half year hiatus. And when we hit zero gravity on my second flight, there was like no adaptation at all. It was just this complete sense of recognition. Yeah, I know exactly where I am. And all your, as I said, a number of habit patterns shift and the amount of force it takes to do something shift. And all that just sort of clicked right back into place. Um, in space flight, there are effects in space flight uh, over longer durations from e even the low radiation levels at low Earth orbit. Um, bone density loss, calcium loss, things like that. Uh, and there's an ongoing program that NASA operates on anyone who's had space flight exposure to try to track that longitudinally. Because again, we're watching the first generation of people with any space flight exposure. So the real answer to your question is we don't know yet uh, what the range of long-term effects is. Is there, is there any greater probability or, or prospect of certain cancers or cataracts or other phenomena we're, we're learning that as we track the first several waves of spaceflight folks through the system. And the durations of flights have gotten longer and longer. So you're now getting you know, six month run times on people. The speed, the, the speed as far as, the speed is why I'm 30 seconds younger. <laughs> uh, you know, that, that much closer to the speed of light, but the speed doesn't have a, a significant effect on it. And in, in both, in both the kind of submersibles that I went down in and the spaceships, you're, this is the atmospheric pressure you're at. So it's this environment, it's just going a lot faster. Thank you, on this side. Oh, you pick. Okay, yeah, 
Do you look like a student leader, Richard? Uh, yeah. Uh, what's the next thing that you think uh, the problem in your in our society is going to be? You're out here. I know a lot of the better uh, long-term uh, long-term program for what you need to do in order to make sure that this isn't the case again. Not what's the next big thing? So the, the question is, what's the next big advance? And not in all of NOAA, but the question is particularly around physical phenomena uh, of the sorts that the Weather Service uh, and other parts of NOAA forecast. Um, well, we're working on all three fronts that you mentioned. Tornado warning lead times, when I was chief scientist, were they, if, if they were five minutes, they were really good. Uh, the, the average over many years now is 14 minutes and sometimes as long as those, and those have improved a lot. Um, we're, they've improved so much that we're getting to the other side of the problem. The other side of the problem, which we saw in Oklahoma City about a year ago, is understanding the, the sociology and the psychology of it. Because if I give you a tornado warning, what I want you to do is right now go under, under that building. If I give you a very long tornado warning, what we start seeing people do is go try to get their kids from school or go get out on the road. That's the worst place to have thousands of people in tornadoes. So we're sort of coming out, having to now deal with the complementary side of the problem of what's the effective response you're hoping uh, to generate in the public. Hurricane track, the track accuracy has just, the, the error rate on that has really gone steadily down tremendously over the last several years. Hur Hurricane Sandy, if that had been 10 years ago, uh, Fugate probably would have recommended evacuations for everything north of Cape Hatteras because the uncertainty was so high. What's been harder to solve is, is consistent prediction of how intense the hurricane is gonna be and what are the conditions that will rapidly intensify it or, or uh, slow it down and weaken it. Uh, we're beginning to see some breakthroughs on that through, in part through those P3 planes that we fly through this morning. Um, SWPSI just within the last year or so has brought online, uh, again in cooperation with NASA, you know, radically new models that actually couple the solar environment to the Earth's magnetic field. So the next one that I would say is really critical is, is there are breakthroughs that are truly critical to make to be able to couple the physical phenomena models to the biological and ecological models. That, that's the breakthrough that'll count the most now. Do we have another question in the planetarium? Okay, how about right here? Um, so the question is, given my personal background, my sense of nurturing deep curiosity and wonder in young kids today, um, Sherry Turkle, many of you, some of you might know the name Sherry Turkle, she's been studying uh, how we live online in, an, in electronic media for decades. She's, she's at MIT. Um, and she's, she's got a new book coming out and she's just been putting some pieces in uh, op-eds on that point, and, it, and it's about, in her, her take, and I would agree with it, is to retake conversation. Uh, actual to and fro, actually putting the devices aside for some period of time for several reasons. One of them is, it, it, is through, it is through reading and conversing that we understand how to navigate with other human beings. We understand emotion, we get empathy. You, you, don't, you don't get that through the, the intel more sterile intellectual interaction with the computer. So we're, we're losing that, and you see that trickling into lots of, uh, lots of different behaviors and problems uh, in school-age kids and societies. The other piece um, that struck me very recently was in the last few days, and I'm not going to remember the author, I'm afraid, uh, but it, it's also about how we schedule and school our kids. And I, the, if I were going to give you a punchline to that, it's we are, we've become so hyper-focused on how kids perform in school that we forgot, we were forgetting to pay attention to how children actually learn. And, and this hyper-programming, I mean, it's bleeding, we've destroyed kindergarten, it's bleeding down into kindergarten. Kindergarten now becomes, the, if it's good to have good reading skills at grade three, I better start drilling you on that at grade two, or maybe grade one, or why not start in kindergarten? Why lose any time? And the reason is because you were not losing time in kindergarten when kids just played. You were developing human beings, and and you can. There's very good, very good research data that shows 
the greater the play and intellectual uh, and, and imaginative stimulus and, and, and learning those, developing those mental circuits in kindergarten, the, the richer that is in an old style kindergarten sense, the better the reading proficiency at, at age 10. So we're trying to, I guess the other punchline is, it's growing in them naturally if you would leave it alone. When you try to pound it into them too soon, you're getting the wrong result. Well, in those early years, there's so much about exploration. It's yes. just different kinds of exploration, sensory and, and otherwise. And, and <coughs> another word for that, the, the, the actual word for that kind of exploration is play. Mm -hmm. It's not pointless, it's not empty, it's not meaningless, just because it's not linear. It's, it's actually, again, some of Sherry Turkle's work with very young children shows that when they are in that play mode at, at very early ages, they actually, because they're reasoning very differently than we reason once we're channeled into very linear reasoning, they outperform grad students and PhDs on some very complex multi-stage mental things because they're still able to go sort of laterally and with different inferences. And we've learned a set of heuristics and a set of methods, and we're now channeled into those heuristics and if there's something happening outside of them, we can't see it anymore and we just go right there. So, you know, be, be careful how you over-design things. I think that's a good note of wisdom uh, to end on at this point. Um, and I would like to thank once again Boeing for generously sponsoring this series of Glenn Lectures each year and for making it possible for us to bring uh, people of the caliber of Kathy Sullivan here to share experiences with us. I'd like to thank you in the audience uh, for being here and being so engaged, and especially I would like to thank you, Kathy. And uh, we would like to offer you as a token of appreciation one of our most recent oh, books, great. Milestones of Space, in which you will find your one of your three shuttles, uh, the Orbiter Discovery, which she flew on, and has visited at the Udvar-Hazy Center, and also your favorite telescope, My favorite uh, telescope. in that book. Um, thank you so much for being here and sharing with us uh, this evening. Uh, Kathy has very graciously agreed to linger for a bit until 9.30 or so at our visitor services desk in Milestones of Flight. So at this point, I would say, let's give her a big round of applause. <laughs> encourage all of you to please exit from the rear, go down the escalator, and she'll be waiting in milestones. Thank you again for coming.